Um, so hi, everyone. I think we're going to uh, go ahead and get started. So I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us today for this uh, webinar and uh, discussion. So our host speaker today is Dr. Cameron Wolf. Um, Dr. Wolf is an associate professor of medicine at Duke and associate um, member of the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, as well as a DTAC member. He's been chair of the Infectious Diseases Transmission Committee at um, his institution, and he has a very active practice in HIV infection and transplant-related infection. So for the first 30 to 40 minutes, he's going to be sharing with us his experience at the Duke uh, Transplant Center. And then following this, we're going to have um, a panel discussion and opportunities for the audience to ask questions. And we have joining us Dr. Dipali Kumar, who's an ID transplant specialist at University of Toronto, as well as Dr. Ruth Sapir Pichadze, who's a transplant nephrologist at McGill, and Dr. Jean Chervinkov, who's a, um, a, a transplant surgeon at McGill. We also have Mrs. Brenda Gagne, who's a community member, um, who will also share her experiences with us. Um, and during the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And during the panel discussion and question period, uh, we'll be sure to go through all the questions. So without any further ado, I'd like to um, present to you Dr. Wolf. Hey, thanks so much for the introduction. I, I really appreciate the chance to, to speak to you all. Um, let me see if I can bring up my slides and if I can just get someone to give me a quick uh, nod to say that you can all see them. Um, so I've intentionally been asked to talk about um, organ donation and, and by definition, therefore, organ transplantation in HIV. And, and this is very much a solid organ transplant talk. I, I'm not venturing into bone marrow stem cell transplants. Um, I'm, an, I'm a transplant infectious disease doc at Duke, as was mentioned. Um, I, I have worked with some industry partners, mainly in COVID, and have nothing to talk about relationship-wise here on the HIV front. Um, I also know, however, that the audience here is a very broad audience. I'm told of both um, people living with HIV, their physicians and transplant teams. And so I, I hope I'm going to cover a, quite a big spectrum there. So bear with me for a little minute as we sort of work our way towards uh, some of the people, what we do here. Um, perhaps a little bit of intentional context here of where I work. Um, Duke University in North Carolina is a um, semi-private institution with a, a large academic teaching hospital. Um, and we serve really the transplant needs for quite a large proportion of the mid-Atlantic coast in the United States. And from a transplant volume point of view, um, I think a proportionally quite a large transplant program with, as you can see here, sort of in the order of, uh, of, of quite a few hundred um, transplants per year, particularly in the thoracic space and liver transplants as well. Um, I, I put that as a beginning context only because I think for transplant providers, it helps set a scene that we, as a large centre, are, are one that automatically can afford to take certain decisions and, and, and sort of risk setting transplants that, that maybe other smaller hospitals can't. So put that in the context of what I'm about to say. So for some, this will be US centric talk. I appreciate I'm chatting to a Canadian audience, but I think our data will overlap quite substantially, we'll see. Um, you know, the, the HIV epidemiology here in the US is still um, intriguing for many ways that I'm sure this audience knows all too well. You know, we have a, a, approximately an estimate of 1.2 million infections um, at the moment with about one in seven of those who sadly don't know. They've never had the chance to have a test. Um, but with a, both a sort of socioeconomically variable, racially variable, and sadly geographically variable um, uh, infection wave that we still see, particularly in the southeast of the country where, where my hospital is based. Um, but there's been some wins here, and the, the wins have really been, as you can see on the bottom left, a steady decline, as I'm sure you would have experienced in, in morbidity and mortality associated with HIV, thanks to the advent of great drugs. But we still add approximately 30,000 people to this pool each year in the US, and that becomes um, 
a steady increase in people living with HIV who have chronic end organ disease, be it kidney mainly, people on dialysis, but also liver disease, lung and heart disease. And it's that cohort of individuals who I think are most uh, at benefit of a robust transplant program, which we'll get into. So what, how am I talking about this? Well, the first obvious part is that this is the sort of the cocktails that many of you might be familiar with that I grew up training with when I, tr I trained in Australia. And, uh, you know, thankfully we have just come through a, a, a revolution in HIV therapeutics, which not only has made HIV treatment that much more efficient and safe and well-tolerated, um, but it has been um, wonderful from a transplant point of view where traditionally the number of drug interactions that we would face um, was, whilst not prohibitive, certainly complex and added a lot of difficulty to what we used to do. We have had a steady increase in our transplant activity. And so what I'm going to do here is set the scene originally for positive HIV recipients of organ transplant and show increases and, and good outcomes in that space. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about HIV donation as a second phase to that. So at least within the US, you can map back a really very steady increase in transplantation volume, particularly as we sort of moved into the last decade. Um, these are kidneys on the left and livers on the right that you can see here. Um, kidneys with a particularly steep increase, liver less so as we've found out that we can in fact treat people out of their hepatitis and not lead to so many patients with end organ liver disease. But the take home message here is that this has become for people living with, with well controlled HIV quite a standard thing that almost all transplant centers now here would, would consider part of their standard operating process is to evaluate patients living with HIV, move them through the process of transplantation at a pace that they deem uh, necessary for their, for their illness. And the outcomes have been pretty good. So for recipient outcomes only, some of the oldest data we had here in the US came from a large NIH cohort, uh, sort of coordinated out of San Francisco, where survival of kidney transplants placed into people living with HIV was basically quite comparable to folks who are HIV negative. You can see here that the Kaplan-Meier graph is ever so slightly lower than the red line, which is all transplants occurring in the US. And perhaps in the context of this being done in the early 2000s was, was related to some of the uh, more complicated HIV drug regimens, should I say. But it gave people an early sort of foot in the door to believe, look, hey, there's, there's no reason here from a medical point of view that we shouldn't weigh up the candidacy of HIV recipients um, just as equal as their HIV negative co colleagues. Similarly for liver transplantation, that's a more complex process. And I want to highlight two pieces here that basically leave us now thinking that liver transplantation is equally um, something that we should be offering everyone who needs it. The bottom line, blue line here points to the outcomes of liver transplant before we had great hepatitis treatments. And I think you can see here that there's a, a big drop off in the survival curve of the liver if people were coming to the table with untreated HIV, sorry, untreated hepatitis C as well as their HIV. It was much more complicated. The outcomes were not as, not as good. The treatments for hep C were, were difficult to manage back in the Furon days um, after a transplant. What you can see from that second blue line is the moment we had the advent of some of our current um, contemporaneous hepatitis C treatments, actually the outcome for HIV positive patients needing a liver transplant is basically on par with their HIV negative compatriots. So some, again, good evidence to support the fact that we should be moving our recipients who carry HIV through the transplant. This is now standard for us here. And even when you get into the less common transplant, so this is a summary of lungs and hearts, it's a few years old now, but Again, preliminarily, when you look on the right-hand side, this is survival of people after a heart or a lung transplant, the red line being um, standard lung and heart transplant survival rates across the globe, the blue line being those who carry HIV. The outcomes are felt to be about the same, provided your HIV control was good coming into this. And certainly, I think most people would agree, good HIV control these days is much easier to achieve than it might have been 10 or 15 years ago. So I paint a picture to sort of say that, look, most centers now, and I think this is true for 
most Canadian transplant centers would have very clear algorithms set up as to how to evaluate someone who's coming to them needing a transplant who's HIV positive. These are some of the common national ones set up in the United States. There may be subtle differences where, where you work, but the take home point is if you can prove ahead of your transplantation that you've got well-controlled HIV, that you take your medicines and your viral load is largely undetectable, and that you're not going to bring an opportunistic infection into the transplant setting, um, that we would consider that as being a, a, a suitable candidate. In fact, I often argue that it's a better candidate than some of my HIV negative colleagues when I'm speaking to my transplant teams because I can have a great track record of their viral load showing here's someone who I know takes them medicines in a really consistent way is able to handle that sort of stress that will come after their surgery. So we would accept any organ system here for HIV. That is probably true in now most big centers in the US. Where we run into problems though is organ supply. And unfortunately, at least in the United States, we have a wait list that is over 100,000 um, in total. And, uh, and a vastly inferior number of organ donors um, who can enter into that pool to take people off, off the wait list. And so whilst there's very good efforts to try and allow people to sign up in the United States, prior to 2015, it was actually, excuse me, not allowed for someone to willingly um, offer to become a donor or for a recipient transplant center to, to knowingly accept that organ um, if that person was HIV positive. We did, however, have growing evidence, particularly out of a large South African group, that this was probably going to be safe. And so one of the things that occurred during the previous, uh, sorry, two previous US administrations ago was a recognition that, you know, hey, we, we, should, we should try and really open up the doors here. And so the, the HOPE Act, as it's now called, was signed into play. This is the a, a legis piece of legislation at a federal level in the United States that allowed for someone who was... HIV positive, whether they knew it or not, to become an organ donor specifically for recipients who were also positive. And that was signed into play, um, boy, now, as you can see, uh, nearly, uh, nearly a decade ago. It did also take a good amount of individual state legislative change. We here in North Carolina had to actually change our state statute as well. Um, intriguingly, states have sort of jurisdictional control over many things in the transplant space more than their federal colleagues do. But this was the initiative really that sort of lit the fire for, for centers to, to start moving policy in, in their favor. So what that has led to is first of all, a good discussion of people who might want to become donors who are living with HIV to understand sort of, do they bring unique perspectives to the table? And this is a group out of Hopkins, so Baltimore, the sort of mid-Atlantic coast in the US to try and say, well, look, you know, what are some of the concerns from HIV positive individuals who might be wanting to donate? As you can see here, um, some good hopes early on that this might reduce discrimination, um, that there was a firm belief that, they should, that, that individuals should have the choice and sort of the autonomy to consider donation um, and that absolutely this should be studied. Um, and that for the most part, people were very willing to consider deceased donation. Some people less so, but would, would also strongly consider living donation or both as well. So policy actually in the United States now exists to say you can be um, a deceased or living donor for, for HIV organs um, if you're positive and your recipient will be also HIV positive. There was still some anxiety in the in the in the uh, community in general. I would say when this first rolled out, and I, I'd highlight a couple of points here. The first was the sort of first line here. You know, will my organs have adequate function in the recipient? And despite some of those earlier tables that I showed showing pretty good outcomes in our HIV positive recipients, we didn't know what that would be like if an HIV positive kidney was transplanted. And there was an anxiety there as well as interestingly, a trust in the medical system, which I think is uh, probably pervasive through many of our clinics. So a little bit of work that we had to do early on, I would say. But this has been now widely uptaken in the US. So each of these little stars represents a, a university hospital that would uh, um, be willing to accept HIV positive deceased donors. 
Um, there are also a smaller number of centers who would take living donation, either for liver or kidneys. We started with liver and kidneys in the United States only because the federal government introduced a basic rule that said you have to have had enough experience in managing HIV positive organ recipients in order to cross a threshold where from a safety point of view, we think you're suitable to begin doing work and research on HIV positive donation. And just less hospitals have crossed that threshold. So this is not every transplant hospital by any means. So I want to walk you through a little bit about sort of what how I think about this as a transplant physician who receives calls that some of my patients might have organ donors available. So the first thing is that our first test is what's the quality of that organ? Does it meet our standard um, organ quality benchmark that I would be prepared to cross for transplant under any other circumstance? Because if it doesn't meet that quality level, I don't, it doesn't matter about for HIV. I shouldn't be putting my recipients through a surgery for um, assuming that to be true, you'd be surprised to say actually about 30% of tests that are done on organ donors turn to give us false positives, either their antibody or their um, PCR test turns out to be a low positive. Um, probably the argument there is that the pace needed to assess a donor needs to be very quick in the deceased donor world, and sometimes you, you end up with, with a, a higher number of false positives. But they are organs that five years ago, 10 years ago, would have been discarded in the United States, even if they were perfect quality. And yet these days for an HIV positive recipient, that is a, that is a, a true gift in my mind. Most people in the United States who become organ donors here who are HIV positive knew about that diagnosis, have done a great job of being compliant. And then I can look at my recipient's meds and clearly say, yes, your Bictavi, your Triumac, your whatever, will or will not have good control over that person's virus as well. And I'm not running the risk of viral emergence. This is a predictable situation. And nine times out of 10, we'd say, yeah, this is going to be a good transplant. One out of seven people, as I said at the beginning, don't know they've had HIV. And so this adds a little wrinkle in that they're becoming an organ donor because they're passing away with virus on board if they're not on meds. But a simplistic calculation on my end to say, provided that person's not dying of an opportunistic infection that I could transmit, then I'm very confident if they've not had meds that their chance of having drug resistant virus is actually really low and that my recipient's meds are likely to work. The person where we have to sort of think a bit more carefully is the organ donor who might have had a documented poor history of taking compliant medicines or documented known resistance where I'm not sure that I want to give that drug resistance to my recipient. And sometimes even for good organs there, we may pass. So how has this played out? Um, so nationally in the United States, every center who's been a part of this has been required to report back their outcomes. And these are summarized here. So in fact, for, for kidneys, as you can see here, the outcomes have been terrific. They've been, um, in terms of graph survival, exactly on par with HIV positive recipients receiving negative organs. There's been marginally more rejection, which is curious because I, I don't think we have a perf perfect understanding of why that's the case. I think my suspicion is that we've tended to under immunosuppress our re transplant recipients in some way being a little bit nervous that maybe their HIV status leads them to more infection, whereas in fact, I think it leads them to be more prone to reject their organs. And What's been critical is to recognize that, in fact, there's, there's not higher infection rates by taking a positive kidney. There's not higher rates of breakthrough HIV infection in my recipient. And in fact, the graph survival at a year and now beyond is, in fact, exactly the same. So this, to me, is a, is a, is a very good example of what works well to increase the total number of organs available to give patients the autonomy to become donors and to increase the likelihood of my recipient actually getting an organ. Livers remain a little bit more challenging. So in liver transplant, the numbers are much less. What you see here is you do actually see, whilst survival is about the same, there has been a slight increase in the number of infections transmitted through liver transplant and actually cancers that have evolved in the recipients. And I think this is a... Um, work to be played out because the numbers remain low. That's something that we just have to be a bit more careful about still. And there's no 
um, reported outcomes yet for any other organ in the United States, hearts, lungs, spleen, uh, kidney, pancreas. Um, we don't know yet. What do the donors look like? Um, for the most part, I'm going to skip a little bit here. For the most part, these are people who can have widely variable CD4 counts. And in fact, that does not ultimately matter. Part of the challenge here is if you're in the stress of going through what becomes your terminal illness, and often these patients are managed with steroids, often they're in an intensive care, a high sort of physiologic stress environment, the measurement of their CD4 count um, can be inaccurate, often quite low. And so you'll see here that actually a lot of the organs transplanted in the United States come from donors who on the surface of it look to have quite low CD4 counts. And yet, even in that context, you saw that the infection rates for their recipients were exactly the same. So in fact, there's, there's not been a cutoff for which um, we say, uh, this donor is too immunosuppressed, we can't use them. Provided they're dying of a reason that's not an AIDS-defining illness, um, it may well be that that kidney's a good quality or that liver's a good quality. So here's the part that's interesting also, because the current number of centers who do this in the United States is low enough that the number of people on the wait list is low. You can see here the kidney wait list as of January this year in the United States was 54. The liver wait list was two. And in fact, it's now one because we transplanted one of those people yesterday. And so if you're one of only 54 kidney patients in the United States signed up for this program, you have select um, rights, if you will, priority on the wait list to any HIV positive donor who comes to pass in the whole country, as opposed to the 85,000 people on the general, HIV, the general wait list for transplant. So in fact, it's led to this interesting sort of balance where my HIV patients actually have markedly shorter, we think, wait times to get transplanted because they have now two different pathways to receive their organs, one through HIV negative organs, as the standard as everyone else, and one through they have the unique ability to take organs from a deceased donor who carries HIV. And so in fact, if I'm someone who's you know, struggling with advanced liver failure, this is a compelling argument to move that person quickly and, and, and give them life-saving transplantation. So there's a couple of um, like I wouldn't say for a minute that this is straightforward. And let me paint you a story where we've got to be a bit careful. It's a 43-year-old donor who was evaluated for us now a good number of years ago, had come in with new seizures and yet had very good functioning kidneys and kidneys were thought to be good donation. She had never known about her HIV until that point. Um, and so had not been on meds, virus would be easily controlled by any of the meds that my recipient was on. And yet an interesting sort of, difficult history of, of some psychiatry medicines in the background and people thought that this was probably the reason why she had had this new seizure and passed away um, but to cut a long story short on further evaluation was actually dying of cryptococcal meningitis um, missed because sadly we still miss diagnoses of hiv in the united states and critical in this context because Cryptococcus as a fungal infection is readily transmissible through transplant. And this was someone where even though they had really good kidney function, even though their HIV would not have posed us a problem, the risk of that kidney carrying an infection of significance related to their HIV led us to, to, to not move forward. It's one of the few cases where we've actually said no to a HIV positive organ. I'm going to flip around a little bit. The HOPE Act, as I said, allows us to take HIV positive donation. And this gentleman is very public about his donation through us. There's been now three living donations in the United States. Um, he is a wonderful gentleman who actually works in transplant as an organ procurement officer, helping facilitate transplants in general, and had been HIV positive for many years, had uh, or had, didn't know his recipient. He altruistically put his hand up and said, you know, I want to forward this. I've always thought about doing this. And then my HIV status, I thought I'd be ruled out forever. And you, this is a pathway. And our recipient, and they still have not met four or five years down the road, um, has had life-changing transplant surgery as a result. He's off dialysis. He's gone back to having a job. It's been utterly game-changing for the two of them. And 
you know, I, I, I'll pause here for a minute while I get a drink and just let you read his quote because I think it sums up why we want to do this. You know, it, this was not a difficult decision for me to make. I, I, I thought I could help. Um, it was, it's a very sort of open, reflective comment in many ways, but I think reflects, uh, reflects why we think this is valuable. So living donation in the US and in Canada traditionally can happen through a number of different ways. You can say who you want the kidney to go to. You can not be a perfect match to the recipient who you want to give it to, but maybe there, someone else has a donor who could be a cross match. Or in fact, you can say, I, I don't mind who you give it to. You, dear recipient sender, you can choose someone on your list who would deserve this kidney, warrant this kidney. This is the way we chose this for our case. All of these are possible in the HIV setting, provided that the, the donor is giving at the end of the day to a positive recipient. This has led to some really interesting research. So we had some, uh, we have a, a center here that specializes in HIV nephropathy. And so in fact, the ability to look at HIV strains from the donor when they get implanted into a recipient and then say post-trans Transplant, whose virus survives um, was pretty unique. And in fact, it turns out that both survive. Um, there was some fear initially that viruses would sort of fuse or cause recombinants or mutants. And we have not been able to document that here nor at any other site that I'm aware of. But you do see survival in the kidney as a reservoir of HIV that exists. And so donor virus for a good period of time will exist in the kidney suppressed because of the meds that that recipient is on. Um, and yet you can find um, both strains existing. And Marion Hemmersbach uh, listed here on the photo is one of our old fellows who contributed to this. Legislatively in the US, we have more challenges than I suspect that you do. Um, that's in general, but that's also particularly in the case of HIV. Um, because of those rules that set in place minimum standards for every hospital to have achieved, there's no one who's been able to reach the threshold as a transplant center, even if you do hundreds of transplants a year to transplant HIV positive lung donors. Um, there's only been one heart. There's never been a kidney pancreas combined. And so we in fact have disincentivized our organ procurement teams from wanting to sort of work hard to make donation possible for organ donors who would be willing, but where that transplant procurement program is afraid that they will not be able to ultimately place the organs. And uh, I can certainly get into the politics of this if, if we need be, but I, I'll be left with this sort of sad feeling that we still have a, a level of institutional stigma in the United States that somehow treats this as different. Um, I can make the choice with my patient who needs an organ to take hepatitis infected kidneys, to take COVID infected organs, if need be, to take any number of different organs carrying different things if, if it's de deemed appropriate and urgent for that recipient, and yet HIV is treated differently. And I, I find that very uh, unsettling, I would say. And I'll pitch it that here's the final comment. So there are, it's, there are instances outside of the United States where people have made the autonomous choice to go, you know, I'm HIV negative, but if I'm going to die here in desperate need of a heart transplant, would I take a heart pump and all the complexities that come with that? Or would I be prepared to take a young, healthy, good quality heart and take Bectavi um, that they would take the HIV positive heart? And I would write down, I tell, tell all my fellows, if I'm in imminent need of a liver transplant or a heart transplant, I don't mind about taking an HIV medicine if that's what's going to allow me to live through my illness. And yet legislatively in the United States, we can't do that. Um, it has occurred accidentally in a number of situations, and I list those on the right, with perfectly good outcomes. You know, people who are HIV positive go through transplant okay, even if they got their HIV at the time of transplant. And it's actually happened once intentionally in South Africa where a positive mum gave her a fragment of her liver to her negative child who was in desperate need of a liver transplant. And my understanding is that case has also worked out well. So I'm going to pause there. I hope what I've done is to paint a picture that 
for HIV recipients, we think this should be standard of care. If you can come to my transplant evaluation showing you're capable of taking your HIV medicines, you, they control your virus, and yet you have chronic illness as more and more people have that needs transplantation, then you should be just as good a candidate as anyone else. And more the point, I have had like emotional conversations with people now to say like, hey, you can become an organ donor. That's someone last year who, who like I've cared for for 12 years in my HIV clinic who I just said, hey, have you ever thought about this? And she, she burst into tears. She was saying like, I've, I've never... I've never thought that they would want something from me was sort of the turn of phrase, like as if to say that this was somehow a measure of, 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 of some measurable inadequacy, which it just isn't. Um, and so I now have quite empowering conversations with all my patients to say, hey, you can go and sign up to be an organ donor today. And, and absolutely people will value that decision. Um, so with that, I will stop my share. I think I might have been roughly about my half an hour a lot of time <laughs> and uh happy to take questions or i think we've got a discussion coming to yeah thanks so much cam that was a great talk so yeah i see there's some questions from the audience so um how about we get started i think the first person who had their hand up was um, um i'm not sure if she's still in is still there full sade no. Okay. Um, oh, oh, hi there. Sorry. Yes, perhaps you can just quickly introduce yourself and then uh, ask your question. My name is Falasha Day. And I'm a research coordinator oh. with uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. And I'm involved in a lot of um, community works. So my question actually is, because I signed up for this uh, webinar, or uh, not actually knowing what I'm coming into, I just like really want to find out what's it, um, like what advantages or what do we need to learn? What's the message I'm taking back to the community member about this organ donation? Thank you. No, it's a great question. I mean, I would I would say it's it's threefold. If you're if you're an, if you're a person living with HIV now. I would say there is no reason in the United States, and I understand also in Canada legislatively, that you cannot become an organ donor and and and, and have that autonomous choice to do so. It is, it is valuable. Um, number two, as an HIV recipient in the United States, and this is US-centric policy, um, this dramatically increases your likelihood of being offered a really good quality transplant and gets people life life affirming and life saving transplantation quicker. Um, and I would say as the third point, I find this a helpful program to continue to try and knock down stigma that still exists in the HIV space. Why these days when we have wonderful HIV control therapies, we are left sort of somehow imagining HIV is somehow different is beyond me. And I find this a helpful way of, of knocking stigma down. And I hope other people do too. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's so meaningful. Then um, I, I just this one thing I need to clear that currently in this, uh, in the medical sector, you see uh, people living with HIV can't even donate blood, right? And it's a common thing. I've seen people ask questions, they get worried. Oh, my child is sick and I can't even do this. You know, even up to like, of course, the breastfeeding aspect of it is a different thing. So um, uh, like blood donation, for example, is it going to be for something like um, for research purposes or I don't know, is that law ever coming into place? Somebody like a positive person donating blood for another positive person, that's something that has not been in practice. Is that something, are we also looking at that as part of what we're talking about today. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. We're, we're not yet, and I'll, the reason is a balance in organ availability versus blood availability up front. So we have an absolute national shortage in available organs in the United States, such that um, this is a great pathway for more transplantation to save lives. 
as much as our blood banks in the US, I'm sure in Canada, always are nervous that they have, uh, you know, shortages on their blood donation. Um, they're not usually life-threateningly short shortages. And, and therefore, I think the sort of the immediacy of the risk, like if I can't get someone who's potentially needing a heart transplant, their heart in the next week, they may die, whereas I can probably always get them some blood. So I think the risk tolerance to do different things is different in the solid organ transplant space. You're a little more risk tolerant. This is going to happen there first. Um, do I see a situation where it might move into the blood bank setting? I don't know. Blood banks are very cautious, appropriately so, with the way that they manage manage themselves. So this is solid organs only at this point, to be very clear. Um, Dipali, Ruth, or Jean, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, um, I think Jean has his hand up. Yeah, uh, one of the things I, I may want to add is that um, even though um, donor positive to recipient positive is encouraged and, um, and, and we tend to look for that combination, um, I, I have to say, uh, and Ruth, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in many instances, we find uh, donor negative uh, kidneys and we transplant a lot of our HIV positive patients who need an organ with the, with the non-positive donors uh, because that's kind of the nature of, uh, of our OPOs. They, they do the NAT tests and occasionally they'll find a positive uh, uh, donor, but by all means, uh, we're not restricted to, to positive donors. And we, we have in mind simply the well being of other recipients. So we will go ahead and use all available organs for these recipients. I just want to make sure the audience doesn't think that we are deliberately delaying the transplant to find a positive donor. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point, John. And I didn't mean to undersell the point that our, our recipients in the US are on both the regular transplant list and also an HIV positive transplant list. So whichever one comes their way is the is the choice that we take. Absolutely. I just think this offers them some additional chances. And if you're a if you're in the procurement world, you when you start to see a potential organ donor with a positive test you then have a national list of all of the possible recipients for that person in front of you, which gives you a quick yeah, access. To that, that's right. And, and often in our province, we will skip. Uh, we will skip uh, if we don't have any potential recipients here for whatever reason, we'll just go across Canada after that and we'll offer that organ. We haven't done across the US and that's something maybe to discuss at the ATC. Uh, if we have a chance to meet in San Diego, that should be potentially uh, something to discuss because often we might lack any recipients uh, for positive donors in a particularly, uh, you know, more rare blood groups like a B positive or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. We'd love to. Um, I think uh, Sherry had her hand up next. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Sherry Margulies, and I've been living with HIV for 30 years. Uh, I'm, uh, I work closely with Cecilia uh, on the CanCure team, as well as uh, I'm co-lead of uh, the community engagement team at the Canadian HIV Trials Network. My question is, uh, you know, and, and maybe Jean might want to pipe in on this as well. So here I am. 30 years with HIV, I'm 60 years old. I have no way to, at, as far as I know, to say, take my organs when you die, uh, unless I tell Cecilia or something like that. And, you know, work that out with my doctor. So could you talk a little bit about how, um, how people with HIV can get on, get on the organ donation list in the United States and how you're managing that. And then I guess to Jean, like, are we making any progress in Canada with regards to uh, uh, opportunities for us to volunteer our organs, either live or dead? Yeah, fantastic question. I mean, I, I'll speak to the US uh, pathway. Um, you can 
you can go online to donatelife.net and click the button and you, you'll be registered. Um, similarly, anytime you turn up to, to our um, DMV and get your driver's license, you can say yes and, and they'll get a little heart stamped on your driver's license that says you're an organ donor. Um, and both of those, at least by US law, um, that sort of um, intentionality of that active decision trumps family opinion that, that that might come after you've passed away. If you've made that intention clear, then, then, then that holds the day. Um, but to, to your point, we had to make a pretty concerted effort early on, I think, to speak actively to nephrology groups um, on to, who, who had previously just assumed that their patients couldn't be transplanted as easily or couldn't be donors. We, we made solid efforts amongst the HIV community, although probably not ideal, to talk in HIV clinics to say, look, hey, you should go around and discuss this now with your patients who are doing well because they can do this. Um, I, I've been surprised that we've only had three living donations in the United States in five or six years. Actually, I anticipated there'd be many more because, in fact, people have traditionally in the community been very good advocates for research within their own community settings. Um, so that's how it happens here. It's actually quite an easy process once you know that you can legally able to do it. No one asks you your HIV status whenever you sign up for those things. Yeah, maybe I can comment on the Canadian uh, situation. Thanks. So, yeah, so Sherry, that's a, so first of all, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, in Canada, it's very similar to the United States that when you renew your driver's license or you get a driver's license, there's a form with it that says you can sign up to be an organ donor. And there, of course, you know, ha uh, having HIV or not is not a consideration um, on that form. So certainly, you know, that form can be can be filled out. And then you're you're basically part of um, the provincial registry of um, organ donors. So um, but just to kind of uh, just take a step back and say, you know, how how does organ donation actually occur? So there are there are two uh, organizations, you know, that are involved. So one is your uh, what we call the ODO or the organ donor organization, same as the OPO in, in the US. And then the other is your transplant center. So, um, you know, if when there is a donor um, identified, the ODO gets called and, and the donor may be anywhere in the province, the ODO will get called and um, they will they will then ask for consent from the donor's family. Now, even if you have signed your, um, you know, the driver's license form, um, there will be a chance again for your family to um, to consent. And, and so there need, does need to be a discussion with family members, you know, once you have signed um, your, your driver's license consent. So um, once that once the consent is obtained, um, then you know the ODO will uh, you know they'll be informed. Okay, well um, this is a person uh, who has had HIV, and uh, and then and then each ODO has a criteria. So um, many ODOs, the criteria is that um, you know HIV positive organs may be they'll probably turn them down unless. Um, they are aware that there's a recipient with HIV waiting at the transplant center. So in that situation, um, you know, the ODO will consider those um, organs and will call the transplant center and say, um, you know, hey, we have good quality organs for your HIV positive um, recipient. So that's kind of how it works in Canada. In Canada, there's no law. You know, there's no law that says, you can't use a um, organs from somebody who has uh, HIV. There's, there's, uh, it's simply a criteria of the, um, the ODO, the organ donation organization. Um, but those criteria can be, you know, changed if there's somebody who has HIV waiting at a at a transplant center. Thank you. Interestingly, we have a friend of our family. Uh, who had severe kidney disease and who is not HIV positive and was offered an HIV positive uh, kidney in Ontario, which is really super interesting. So I guess the takeaway for this for me is that we're just not 
spreading the news. I think we just automatically assume, like the patient that uh, was described earlier, that we can't donate organs. So I know when I renewed my license, I mean, when, since I was 16, I was an organ donor. But once I became HIV positive, I didn't tick that box again when I renewed my driver's license. So for me, that I, I see, say we have a lot of knowledge uh, translation to do on that issue in the HIV community. Thank you. That's a great point. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. Um, I think Jonathan was next. Yeah, I, I should have changed uh, my if, background. So thanks. If, uh, if I thanks. may add one, one caveat to Sherry's question. Um, in Quebec, there's two other options. One is to add it to your healthcare card because many more Quebecers have a healthcare card than a driver's license. It's universal. And so we have a little um, sticker on the back of your healthcare card. You can add your option of whether you want to be a donor or not. And the other option in Quebec is because we are under Napoleonic code, a civil code, which means that you can go to your notary, make that notary aware of your wish, and that actually becomes a legal document. And no one can go against that document. That's one more option in the province of Quebec, where you can become legally a donor. Uh, and so the family cannot go against that wish if it's uh, notarized. Uh, and so the thing you can do is for living donors, uh, if you're positive, but you don't have anyone who you know needs it, who's positive necessarily, you can then put it into the pair exchange program across Canada and kind of give it to the next HIV positive recipient on that list. And then you can start a cascade of multiple donors and multiple transplants. Um, so thanks, Cameron. That was a great talk. I'm uh, Jonathan Angel. I'm an infectious disease physician in Ottawa, and I work with a lot of people that are on the call. And I, I you know, um, I think Sherry kind of took the words out of my mouth and you mentioned it. I think it's an educational, this is an educational thing. And, I, and there was a specific case that I was dealing with that I spoke to both Depali and Cecilia about it. it. It wasn't even for donation. It was a patient who was, wanted to give their body to donate it to a university or to science. And they just had the assumption. And again, to reiterate what, what Sherry's point was, they had the assumption because he had HIV, he couldn't do that. So I think that's pervade that that thought is pervasive. So not even donating an organ to another individual, but just giving their body. They were under the assumption they couldn't. Now whether they can or not is complicated. I've dealt. I've spoken to one of the schools here. I've talked to Cecilia about it. It's not quite clear whether you can or you can't. That's a separate issue. But the 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 point was this is an assumption amongst individuals living with HIV, whether it's donating an organ or even donating your body to science. So I think. So no, that's the that and you mentioned as well that that the uh, um that's one thing that needs to be addressed i don't know what your views are on that or you've had any experience with donating uh, uh um someone's body to a university so yeah as as you were saying that i was thinking that boy i need to now go and look up my own uh, university's law when it comes to that um i'm not sure but I think your point is really well made, which is that the perception, I think most commonly that people run into is that they know they can't be a blood donor and that that perception then filters into donation of all types. You know, can't donate blood, can't donate plasma, can't donate organs, can't donate myself uh, sort of to research. And I, and that's a hard message to counteract because, you know, we're sitting here saying, hey, you can be a kidney, liver, heart, lung donor, but I still can't donate your blood. And, and that just it just needs to filter out. And so I think the right channel has always been for transplant teams, number one, to recognize that, yes, this is possible. Yes, the outcomes are pretty good. And yes, if you have someone particularly who's in an urgent need of a transplant, you should think about this. But particularly um, amongst HIV provider groups and patient groups, this is where this is where your there's great evidence outside of HIV that your statement about your intention to want to be an organ donation donor whenever in time that is in the future dramatically increases the likelihood that when you actually pass away the rest of your family will all go ah like we've talked about this you know he or she was absolutely interested let's let's move forward 
um, whereas often I think all of the associated family then, if you pass away and no one knew about your HIV status, they're that much more likely to say no. Um, and I'm so it's it's very much an educational issue. I'm, I'm certain of that. Right. And I think Jeff uh, had his hand up there. Yeah, thank you. Fascinating talk. Jeff Taylor, um, 40 year HIV survivor and, and uh, member of the Last Kiss Protocol team at UCSD, where people do whole body donation, specifically for HIV cure research. So we've had a lot of experience um, with some of these issues, but not organ donation per se. But I'm wondering, you know, as I listen to this conversation, what can we do as advocates to kind of move the needle on this? And also, you know, as an HIV negative person in California, I mean, HIV positive person rather in California, can I, is there an HIV positive donors list so that you in, in North Carolina, if I get hit by that proverbial bus tomorrow, you could uh, <laughs> harvest some of my organs or how does that, do you have to be in a specific area? I know there's a transplant center in San Francisco, but you know, what are the logistics of that? Because if people are interested, they want to know how it works, right? So be yeah. able to have that information is really, uh, really helpful. Really good questions. So, so yes, there are Hope Act centers in uh, California. There's one in UCSF. I'm fairly sure UCSD as well. Um, and I don't know about UCLA and Cedar Sinai. I'd have to double check. But yes, there's absolutely centers in California. Um, it's it follow that the donation flow, if you will, follows the national pathway for organ allocation for each individual specific organ, and so it weighs up blood type, it weighs up urgency of the recipient, and it weighs up distance, and therefore organ viability over over space. So for example, if you're that liver patient who we transplanted here yesterday, um, we don't have really the techniques in liver preservation to procure a liver from California and bring it all this way. Mm. And yet we've taken lungs from Hawaii, we've taken kidneys from Alaska, um, and so there's just differences in distance that can exist there. And those techniques are changing, that we're getting better at, at having increasing viability times of trans, transferring transplants. Um, but so distance plays into that calculation as well. Mm. Um, nationally, there's a single list of people who are willing to receive an HIV positive organ. Um, and so in California, for example, if you were to be hit by the proverbial tomorrow, um, then your local organ procurement service would look at your blood type, run that against um, the national list of people who could take an organ in that, uh, in that situation. And then it would be matched based on distance and urgency mm. as a standard calculation. So that's the process. Um, the other part of that process, of course, is that they have to... So, so there's no sort of state border in the US when it, or provincial borders in the US when it comes to organ allocation. Mm. It's all it's all geographic distance um, for the most part. And then the only other part is whether or not there's sort of authorization to move forward. And if you had signed your name on that donor registry, then the answer is yes. There is a great question here in the chat if people wouldn't mind me digging into this. Yeah, idea sure. Go ahead. Yeah. A, a great question that filters mm -hmm. up in transplant all the time. You know, there are some countries in the world, Spain's a common one quoted, where you're assumed to be an organ donor unless you choose not to be. Um, the United States does not have that policy, and I don't think Canada does, but quote me if I'm wrong, um, where you, you know, you have to make an active decision not to donate. Um, I, I haven't really played the numbers as to how that would work in the United States. I mean, my gut sense is that I think it, actually sounds like a great opportunity to increase sort of you don't have to necessarily even increase awareness as much in that setting if it's more automated um but it is there are other complexities to making that work because spain for example does not have vastly more transplant opportunities than we do for lots of other complicated reasons and that would really take national policy well outside of the hiv space to change for that to come to pass so i, I responded to that eh? so that's it's province to province and in Canada. So Nova Scotia has opt out. I don't know if anyone else does. Depali might know better, but uh, Nova Scotia has that. And I don't know if anyone from Nova Scotia is on the call, but. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Jonathan. It's Nova Scotia um, that has that. that. And uh, 
I think what we'll have to see, I mean, that's that's a fairly recent change too. So what we'll have to see is how that uh, works out in terms of um, organ donor numbers uh, over time. It sounds like it's definitely a culture a shift to, a to do chance so. for research because you have provinces right beside each other where you can compare the outcomes there at the time. They just don't have physicians in Nova Scotia. That's the that's the problem. <laughs> Great. Um, I think Nina had her hand up. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Dr. Wolf. Hi, Nina. <laughs> um, How are you? My name is Nina Martinez, and I am the first person living with HIV in the United States to donate a kidney to another person living with HIV. Carl is my successor. Saturday, March 25th, will be four years. Um, and I just wanted to piggyback off the comment, because this is the second time I've heard it on the statement that there have only been three living kidney donors in the United States. There have been eight globally. Um, if you know anything about living organ donation, which a lot of people do not, that's its own educational black hole. Um, it is a very privileged thing to do. You have to have health and at least in the United States, health is not a right in this country. So a lot of the people who are in minoritized populations are placed at risk for conditions that preclude them from donation. Uh, secondarily, the HOPE Act is uh, restricting these transplants to research, although that may soon change, which means that in the United States of the 250 transplant centers, only 30 or so are approved to do these transplants. A subset of those are actively performing those transplants, which means that I, a resident of Atlanta, Georgia, had to travel to Baltimore four times in order to be able to donate. Um, so I hope I'm making the point very clear that if living donation is a privileged act among the general population, um, you have to be of extreme privilege to be able to do it as an HIV positive person because again, as pointed out, people just don't know about these transplants. And I personally believe, having been through the system myself, it is that transplants and transplant ID in the United States has treated HOPE transplants as a transplant-focused problem and not an HIV-focused problem, which fits very well under the HIV and aging discourse. So I would love for everyone on this call who I know is active in the HIV community to help spread the word about these transplants. Um, if you're asking me what my next feat is after finishing my four year uh, follow up at Johns Hopkins, it is to make a documentary film dictating the history of these transplants because you know, if people are not reaching out to general infectious diseases doctors, HIV docs, I do not have a transplant ID doc. So certainly if you're recruiting living donors, you would want to reach out to general ID. If you're, if you're not reaching out to nephrologists and hepatologists, uh, it may be happening to some extent, but clearly not to a wider extent because I approached Johns Hopkins and not the other way around. Um, any, any help would be great. But I just wanted to put a face and a likeness to this um, since Carl could not be on this call. And um, thank you so much for having this opportunity for community. And, and thank you, Dr. Wolf. And, all the best to you. Nina, you're always a phenomenal advocate, so thank you in return. Sorry, I would have called you out if I knew you were on the call, but thank you for speaking up. My bad. Yeah, thank you, Nina. Um, I think uh, Ruth also had something to say. We'll go for another five minutes, so if people have any other questions, um, be sure to um, put your hand up so we can try to address them. So uh, thank you for an excellent session. And uh, in fact, rather than uh, uh, I was going to pose the question to Nina to share with, with us her experience, because in fact, I am a firm believer and I think multiple people um, on this uh, um, uh, Zoom meeting uh, would uh, find this uh, to be important. So uh, outreach through patient stories and donor personal stories. So the journey that has taken you to um, successfully proceed with organ donation is uh, so impactful. And truly, this is the best way uh, to ensure that we educate various stakeholders with regards to the opportunity. 
and as a transplant nephrologist observing patients who are in need of kidney transplantation and unable to gain access to kidney transplantation, I would say education at so many levels is still lacking. Uh, so again, kudos to the organizers for this session, uh, for the talk and all people participating here. With small steps like this, um, uh, there's going to be an impact in the long term. And thank you, Nina, for being uh, um, such a, a generous person and for your initiative in advocating and participating in this kind of an uh, important uh, act. Great, thanks Ruth. And I see a comment from Komal Kumar that if anyone's interested to learn more about the documentary or ways to collaborate, he um, there's an email address there where you can reach out. Great, okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone, especially to Dr. Wolf, as well as to Dipali, Ruth, uh, Jean and Brenda, as well as for everyone who came out today to join us. It's been a great talk and I'm sure we're gonna have more events like this going forward. So thank you everyone. And thanks as well to the CTN and to CanCure for supporting the event.